Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started. So, um, hey, everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, I am really looking forward to this webinar to talk all things sports data analytics and dive deep into US ski and snowboard. So with us are two panelists, Gus and Lily. Thank you both for joining us today. So to give a little background, and these are quite impressive bios, um, we'll start with Gus. So Gus builds systems and mythology to collect and analyze athletic data across the seven US ski and snowboard sports. So previously he's done a few things. He's completed a fellowship at the US Olympic Committee where he did data analysis and helped quantify the selection process of U and ski board, U, US ski and snowboard athletics. He's coached many of the country's top cross country ski athletes and has twice been named a USSA coach of the year. So thank you for joining us. And then Lily is a master's student in biostatistics at Harvard Chan School of Public Health. She graduated from Harvard in 2019 with a degree in statistics and was cap captain of the ski team. She spent two summers working with Gus at US Ski and Snowboard as a high performance intern and with Women in Sports Technology, WIST. So both of them have been very, very busy and I appreciate you both being here today. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And, yeah. and uh, congratulations on all the acronyms and tongue twisters that the uh, US <laughs> snowboard environment brings along with it. Yeah, I'm like, you. I got to get them right, right? <laughs> you didn't make the bias easy, but let's, let's dive into questions and see where that takes us for sure. All right, so let's just get started right out of the gates here. So um, can you guys just recall a moment that you've seen some of the closest um, ski races ever or closest results um, that can just kind of show people how, you know, neck and neck these races can be? I think, I hope most people, if people haven't seen it, they should watch it as soon as this is over. Um, Jesse Diggins win at the Olympics. I think Gus was there in, mm -hmm. in South Korea. Um, I mean, it came right down to the finish. She lunged for the announcers screaming. Um, it was that close. I don't know that that was a pretty close win yeah that that has sort of an I, iconic call by chad selma the 2018 olympic team sprint and both lily and i have obviously backgrounds in cross-country skiing um and <clears throat> it was about you know a, the win was by about this far for the first usa olympic gold medal um, so lots of variables playing into this, those you know, fractions of a second. Um, but if, if we go a little more historical, and I, uh, uh, it's probably the 1998 Olympics. Uh, I think there was a tie for the gold medal um, by to the thousandth of a second in cross country skiing with, with Thomas Olsgaard. And uh, they actually gave them both the tie and it may have been the silver actually now that I say that but um since that they actually stopped going to the thousands of a second just because they were yeah, we'll just give them a tie if they're into the hundredth but yeah I mean races and ski and snowboard I'm we're talking cross country but if you look into alpine or any of the points maybe an aerial sport they come down to the fractions of a second into the fractions of a point um, for every medal and for every competition yeah, so just to reiterate that point through that it can be extremely close and that's why you know this all comes into play of you know who is going to come in with that hundred thousandth of a second um, when it's that neck and neck. So Gus, um, can you just explain to everyone kind of watching just can you just go through the seven different um, types of skiing that we will see with US ski and snowboard. Yeah. Um, man, put me on a spot here to, to talk about all of them, but <laughs> or, or US, if you could just name a few to show, show the range yeah. of US ski. Um, we have, we, we have 184 athletes under our immediate umbrella of the national team. Of course, we also are the umbrella for all of kind of the development, um, and, and youth skiing throughout our country, but that makes up seven different sports and 13 different teams within those sports. So it's a really wide array of athletes ranging from aerobic athletes like cross country skiers, which may ski up to a 50 kilometer race to more kind of anaerobic power based uh, alpine skiers who are more looking at a, a one minute downhill 
or then a more judged competition, uh, like an aerials competition or kind of moguls where you're going off a large jump and basically being judged um, by five different judges on your takeoff, your form, your landing. So each sport is uh, very different and brings um, a lot of different challenges. It is interesting how many similarities you can find when you find a win for one, um, but it's a wider range of problems and you have to be kind of a little bit picky about where you decide to dive in. Awesome. And um, either one of you can answer this question. So with all the differences and with all the challenges, um, is it very safe to say that data analytics plays a key role for each athlete across all of the teams and all of the sports? Uh, I'll start and then I, I want to cue Lily up on this one. Um, yes and no. Uh, compared to some sports, we are in the infancy of data analytics. So uh, we are lucky in that regard to be able to take our cues from a lot of the sports who have done it well and not so well in the past. And some of our sports have taken uh, advantage of data analytics and some, there's a lot of room left to play. Um, an example in my mind would be snowboarding uh, or, or even free skiing, which are relatively new sports, have only really been around for a couple decades. And um, to show you how new it is, we had a recent camp a couple weeks ago and we have snowboarders working on secret tricks, which they plan to uh, uncover at important competitions, whether it be Olympics, X Games, or uh, World Championships. So there's still innovation on the, on the trick side um, every day, which, which means we're a little bit behind on the analytics side. But there are a few sports where we've been able to dig into the data, um, mostly what has happened. And, and Lily's done some of that work um, with some of our, our Alpine teams. She's been able to dig in um, where I feel we have a little better uh, feel. Maybe Lily, you can talk a little bit about your work with Alpine. Yeah, I think um, it's useful to think of like the work that we've done in, in kind of on two separate levels. Um, so on one level is I think what a lot of people think of when they think of data analytics and that's like on an individual athlete basis, like what are the day-to-day -day things that they're doing that we can look at to help them get faster. Um, and we have done that a little bit. Um, that's something that's, it's hard to kind of apply to everyone. It's hard to tell every skier on the US ski team, this is what will make you faster. Um, because it is, it's really, we're all different um, and everyone's physiology is different. Um, I did do a project this past summer looking at training data from a skier on the US ski team um, and like providing her coaches with recommendations about what things in the week leading up to a race and her training um, were associated with better performance. Um, and then the second level that we've also done some work on is like bigger picture athlete development. Like what is the trajectory, um, the general trajectory of the world's most successful athletes. So like how good were they when they were 15, 17, 21? Um, and so where we have like with sports like Alpine, where we have data going back into like the early 1990s on um, like career results at different ages, we can look at people who got uh, medals at the Olympics and kind of devise like or, um, a trajectory for, for where our most successful athletes should be at different points in their career. So you, you touched on a point that I think is important that it's, you know, everyone's so different. So it's hard to compare each athlete individual, but how does the performance change for um, an individual's athletic performance once you start the tracking? So if you were tracking me, if I was lucky enough to be on the U.S. ski and snowboard team, how might I, my performance change if you start to tell me certain things about my eating and sleeping and body as a whole? Can that be pretty significant? I, I would say <laughs> yes to no. And I would say you'll probably see the answers in a couple of years, whether it's yes or no. But I would say what we've been working for them in the last couple of years, and Lily's been really key in this, is, is really understanding what has made successful athletes. And I think, uh, so we're, in my view, a little bit catching up. And now we've been able to give some recommendations to athletes 
going forward and hopefully this will help their uh, performance, but we kind of think about it in a couple different funnels. So one is simply just health and wellness um, and that's keeping an athlete basically on the hill training and competing um, physically, but, but also mentally, we've been doing a little bit more work recently on, on looking at uh, athlete welfare from a mental standpoint and making sure they're a whole human and um, <clears throat> yeah, well-rounded and, and happy. And then of course, there's the, uh, <clears throat> the training indicators, whether you're in the gym um, or using wearables or um, anything, anything like that, that shows kind of, you know, uh, the incremental steps you're making to, to gain fitness basically. And then there's also the competition data to just see, you know, it, it all kind of goes towards the competition data. And we've done a lot of work with the competition data to say, okay, <clears throat> you know, you're doing well, you maybe need to improve here. Um, that's not as useful directly to the athletes as being able to say, if you do 10 more reps of this, it will help you doing this. So that's our challenge right now, but I think we've got that first piece pretty well done um, to understand uh, who the best athletes are. That may seem simple, but, <laughs> um, and, and they, to say what it takes to get there. And yeah. now it's about implementing those. I also think um, like everyone wants like the home run, like tell me what can I eat this specific thing and I'm going to get way faster. Or can I like, when do I, if I take a nap at two o'clock every day, like, is that going to make, is that going to have this huge impact on my performance? But like, um, kind of taken together, all these small recommendations we, we might make might have like a 1% in, increase on performance. But like when we're talking about the best athletes in the world, that could actually mean a lot. So I think we're never going to see like this huge impact or, and it might not even be like a noticeable impact. Um, but like when the margins are so small, like we talked about at the beginning, uh, it's actually even a very difficult kind of mathematical problem that, that Lily's jumped on past couple summers is you, it's not a controlled environment and, and nothing about skiing is controlled. So you have no ability to change one variable and say, this is the impact in a year. Um, you know, of course, if an athlete's doing well next year, that's, that's going to be because of what we did. But if maybe they've had a down <laughs> season, it, you know, may not be us. Uh, but no, for actually, it is, it's really challenging to be able to say, this group do this, because um, we think it might help, but this group don't do this. Um, so we, we have, it's really hard to tease out kind of what uh, impact you are making. Um, but I think the, the easiest validation of what we do is to be able to put kind of better information and uh, more data into our coaches' hands and some of the real decision makers to allow them to make decisions from a more informed place. Um, cause ultimately they are kind of the ones driving these athletes. Awesome. Yeah. So I think you guys talk all about obviously what you do for the program and everything, but you know, I don't think anyone just stumbles into the data analytics. So I definitely want to backtrack a little and talk about your past. So, um, Lily, let's start with you. How did you end up in data analytics and, and, you know, kind of why are you the person and the, the best intern for this job? Yeah. So I think, um, I've always really liked math and I've also always loved endurance sports. Um, and so, uh, in college I took a statistics class and just loved it. I thought it was really cool, um, being able to kind of use numbers to tell a story. Um, and I was also on the ski team, uh, at Harvard. And so I had kind of always, uh, there's a culture in Nordic skiing of being really nerdy about your data. Um, and so I, I love that about skiing and I was always really nerdy about my, my training and data for my, my training. Um, and, uh, so I saw that Gus had been hired by us ski and snowboard to be their performance data manager. And I reached out and asked him if I could help out with any projects, um, that he needed help with. And that kind of developed into a relationship and then this internship for the past few summers. Awesome. And Gus, do you want to tell us a little bit about your path and how you ended up with US Ski and Snowboard? Yeah. Yeah. I also studied math in college and I thought I was good at it until I met Lily. 
and realized that <laughs> I wasn't. Um, so I, I was also a cross country skier and I skied professionally for a couple of years after college, transitioned into coaching, had some success there, um, but realized that ultimately um, I wanted to impact the sport maybe a little bit more from a macro level. I um, decided to return to school. Uh, I got my MBA. And interestingly, when I returned to school, I wrote my uh, <coughs> essays for, on my application about creating a position with U.S. Ski and Snowboard to dive into data analytics. And um, it took me about a year after graduating to uh, create this position. Um, but I was, I was able to do a couple projects pro bono and, um, <clears throat> and pitch them. And we've implemented those projects since um, and was hired. And then, you know, uh, there was a couple articles written and Lily asked if I needed, you know, help with anything. And I said, absolutely. Um, and then since then, we've been able to team up on a number of projects and uh, hopefully um, make a difference here with the, with the coaches and athletes of US Ski and Snowboard. Yeah, I love that. And I love how you both kind of just uh, decided that there was a place for you there and you saw where there was a need for it and uh, went for it. Um, I do want to point out this comment from Carrie from Boulder, um, Lily. She said, she quoted you that I like math and endurance sports. And she said, as an English major, she thinks that math is an endurance sport. Um, and I know when you, the three of us met previously, I told you the same thing. I said, I applaud you for all of this. It is uh, something I've always wanted to be interested in and good at, but I was not. <laughs> um, all right. So moving on, I know you guys, you know, talking about how you kind of saw the need for um, this data analytics and that it was lacking somewhat in ski. Can you kind of talk about, um, you know, how you aggregated it all and, and, and got all that information together? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so w the project I was talking about that um, I was asked to look into before I was hired was was actually a quantification of our selection criteria. So before uh, I was brought on, it was it was a lot of discretion. Um, and in some sports, it still is a lot of discretion, meaning the coaches just kind of pick who's on the team. Um, but it was complex and wasn't really backed up by a lot of data. So uh, that was kind of when I started diving into where is the data of the US ski and snowboard. And like almost every organization out there, I think I found out that it's all over the place. It exists in an Excel spreadsheet here, an Excel spreadsheet there on a handwritten note over here in some sort of uh, SQL database over here. Um, and so really task one was, was organizing all of that and the system that we used to do that my first year was uh, an AMS system out of Australia called Smartabase. Um, and they work with a number of different uh, programs in the United States now. Uh, let's see, some NFL teams, some NBA teams, USA Soccer, I believe. And, and we, we help teams when there's onboarding to do, but it's basically, a, think of it as like a business CRM for, for sports. And we're able to kind of aggregate all of that information there. So I spend a lot of my time kind of building um, imports and processes in this system. So coaches and athletes are able, are able to input information. Um, an easy example right now would be we do all of our COVID monitoring through this system because it for our athletes who are all over the world, um, it has an, an adjoining app. So I'm able to build something, push it to that app, and then athletes are able to say, you know, this is how I'm feeling today. And they have to do that twice every day. Now, Lily's been in that system in some of the more ugly corners um, when we were merging uh, medical data sets, which is uh, not the most fun thing. I think we spent like an entire week doing uh, ICD-10 to ICD-9 codes, um, but that is kind of the nitty gritty. Uh, and, and a lot of it does come down to that nitty gritty, the data cleaning. Um, and I would like to say we put that behind us, but that's maybe wishful thinking. <laughs> um, so on that same note, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. Are you, just for the audience purposes, are you guys monitoring different things now that COVID has hit? Uh, yeah. Um, so we have a couple regulations, I guess, just passed down through the uh, governing bodies that we have to do. And, and I think it's 
uh, athletes have to check in twice a day on uh, just symptom reports. Uh, they are, depending on where they are, they are tested. Uh, I want to say once every two weeks now, um, the athletes who are using our facility here in Park City are a little bit more frequent um, as we are as a staff as well. Most staff is still not going into the building as I'm here, um, but really we're just relying on the athletes to pretty much be um, honest with their, their symptom reports and, and just give us that, that heads up. Um, we do use some, uh, uh, some wearables. Um, there's athletes that take their resting heart rates, whether, whether just by hand or, uh, or with a heart rate monitor each night. And a number of our athletes have been wearing uh, an aura ring, um, which is basically uh, a wearable that you wear at night while you sleep mainly. Um, and we've actually had a couple athletes who have had, uh, who have tested positive for COVID and, uh, we were able to look at their data beforehand, during and after, which has been, been really interesting. Um, I actually listened to a podcast yesterday with Will Ahmed from whoop, um, who was saying there was a, a respiratory change, um, from the whoop data. And we didn't, we didn't see that, but we did see just massive variations with, uh, with body temperature, um, which was really interesting. So actually a, a large deficit um, during the times that these athletes were uh, positive, um, somewhat anecdotal because it was only a few, but we've definitely put that as a red flag out to the athletes who are using the aura ring um, with the, you know, on the road saying, watch out for large temperature swings, whether positive or negative. Um, that's an indicator that it may not be COVID, but something's going on. Yeah, that's interesting that kind of as the times change, what you guys study and, and what you'll dive into and report back will change, you know? And it's cool that you have all these wearable devices to also track it when you might not be able to be right next to that athlete anymore or anything. So it's cool that tech has helped in that way. Um, let's shift gears slightly. So Lily, you participated in the WIST program, the Women in Sports Technologies. Can you just give a little background on that and what they do and in your involvement in that program? Yeah, so WIST is a, a, a really cool program. Um, it's basically founded with the goal of changing the ratio of women in sports technology. Um, and so that's everything from marketing, branding, advertising for sports teams to kind of um, more on the technical side with um, a data analytics or, um, yeah, something like that. Um, and so they sponsor um, female students every summer. I think this year there were 15 and there's there might be more next year um, to either uh, work with an established organization in a sports tech internship or kind of do this self-created project. I think there was a one of the fellows this summer was designing a running sneaker from like beach recycled beach trash. Um, so like all over the spectrum um, of uh, different sports technology projects. And so Gus actually found, uh, heard about this and suggested that we apply. Um, and so they funded my summer, this summer with US Ski and Snowboard. Um, and I can't say enough good things about the organization. Um, I think, it was, it was great, really cool for me to be like formally introduced to sports tech as a field um, and to meet this whole network of, of women um, who are pioneers um, in the field and like learn about their paths um, and just get inspiration and encouragement um, from them. Yeah, I love that. And I, I love to see that women are starting to engage so much more in sports technologies. Um, it's definitely a growing field, and I think that um, those women have a lot to offer in it. So, Gus, why was that important to you? I know you also had some um, things running for women in sports because you saw that there was kind of a lack there. Yeah, so, um, well, we are a nonprofit organization, uh, so we are not uh, working with, you know, uh, Dallas Cowboys money, and um, our uh, data and analytics department is, is kind of just a, a team of one at the moment. Um, so we have to get a little bit creative about how we, we fund uh, projects and additional resources. And so first, 
uh, and foremost, you know, thank you so much to, to women in sports tech because we wouldn't have been able to have Lily for the summer without them. Um, <clears throat> but a couple of years ago, we ran a survey um, understanding that we had an imbalance of women in coaching within the organization. Um, this is when I was helping with the coaching side of things a little bit more and um, understanding a few of the barriers there and kind of best practices. And we ended up funding a couple fellowships um, for young women coaches to come along with our staff, which was predominantly male at the time, um, to come to training camps and really just shadow them for uh, a week at a time and, and ask questions and, and get those networking opportunities. Um, and that was a really successful program. And we've been able to hire a couple of female coaches because of that. Um, as I've stepped away from the coaching side a little bit and focused a little bit more on kind of data and analytics, um, it's not exactly a field where <laughs> there's also a lot of women, I realized. And so I was, I was like, well, I, you know, I have this intern program and, and Lily had been an intern previously, um, but we were, we really wanted to find a, a way for her to come back for the summer. And so I thought, why not? just really create a, uh, a fellowship for women in sports data. Um, and so we were able to bring Lily back with that um, because of WIST this past summer, as well as an additional intern. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to continue that program next year as well, uh, bringing another uh, young woman in uh, to the organization to, to help us uh, with, with all the, the data needs. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's very important. And I, I appreciate you both taking that, that on for yourselves. It sounds like you definitely have some startup blood in you getting creative with the funding and opportunities and everything. So I respect that. Um, let me follow up with just one more question. And then we will jump into um, questions from the audience. So for everyone tuning in, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will give you a shout out and definitely make sure that Gus and Lily get to your questions. Um, so the last one for me is just, um, where do you see data analytics going? Or is there anywhere that, um, anything that you really want to see in the next uh, few years for data analytics for US Ski and Snowboard? Or even just your hopes for the program? Yeah, I mean, I think Gus, Gus briefly touched on this, um, but like there are so many challenges to data collection in snow sports. And I think that's the reason why we're, we're behind um, a lot like baseball, for example, or um, a lot of the team sports where we're seeing a lot of analytics or even other individual sports like swimming or running where there's like a standardized result, like a 10 second, 100 meter performance is the same um, regardless. And so I think like in skiing, nothing is standardized. Um, courses are different. Snow is different. Like at, there's just so much variation um, and it's hard to even collect data on the variation, um, which we would need to model it. Like there's nowhere that says, oh, it was, this was the kind of snow um, at this race. So I think like, but I think those things are getting easier. And so I would hope that in five or 10 years, we just have more data on um, those, the, vari the variation. And then once we have data on that variation, um, we can work to kind of model performance um, from, from race to race. Yeah, Natalie, the, the low hanging fruit, <clears throat> uh, I think, and, and this kind of continues on what Lily was, was getting at, is regardless of our sport, we actually have shockingly little idea what happens in between the start line and the finish line. Uh, take Alpine, for example, where they're, you know, you know, of course they may travel two or three miles um, in, a, you know, a very short amount of time at 80 miles an hour um, over variable terrain that uh, is, well, yeah, variable terrain. And also don't forget that it's zero degrees and windy. So our challenge is really, do we, you know, put something on them that can monitor them during this process that um, it better have a, a strong battery or it's not gonna last. Um, and it better be in the right place. And because, you know, a phone, you know, if you're just talking about a ski app in your right pocket is going to be different than a phone in your left pocket. Um, so it's kind of the, the challenge in my mind, it's a race on, 
are we going to be able to measure these athletes performance either mid training or mid competition with something that they have on them or some side of some sort of video that is uh, videoing them and really using advanced analytics to understand their positions um, and their, their movements. Um, and I think probably the answer will be some, some combination of both. Um, but we are a little bit waiting for technology to advance and also maybe to become a little bit more cost effective uh, into our realm. Yeah, I guess the one more thing on that point is like now Gus has built the infrastructure as he was talking about with Smartabase to have all that data in the same place. And that's like a huge step towards being able to do anything with the data. Um, and so I think like we're already seeing the benefits like a couple of years after he's implemented that, um, like we're working on a, a project um, analyzing ACL injury and recovery. And so like we actually have all that medical data in the same place in a standardized format. And so in the next couple of years, I think we'll be able to do a lot of things with, with all that data just from having it in the right place. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to uh, keep in touch and just see where it goes. You know, each year I'm sure there'll be big things happening for, for you guys and data analytics and in US ski and snowboard in general. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into audience questions. Um, so Morgan asks, the weather discrepancies must be amazing from race to race. How do you analyze the differences caused by rain, heat or cold, or even the time of day of a race? Yeah, okay. that's a good one. Um, yeah, go ahead, Lily. Um, I was just going to say it, it, it's really hard. Um, one thing that's helpful is that um, all of the sports, the or most of the sports, I guess you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, results, there's like a finish place, but there's also a points calculation. And that's usually based on like the percent difference that you are from the winner. Um, so that's kind of one way you can quantify someone's performance um, when like their time means nothing. And even their place might not mean that much because it could reflect the strength or the depth of the field. Awesome. Gus, did you want to chime in something? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add that weather's one, one of those tricky things um, that sometimes it feels like there's not a lot of value in recording it because you may not be returning to a venue um, for another year or maybe two years. Um, and, and it may be wholly different conditions the next year. Uh, so we do, can, we do record weather at a given venue. Um, and have uh, now supply our coaches really with like kind of a, here's what's happened here in the past. Um, and and maybe, maybe the weather is completely different this year. Um, so maybe it doesn't help, but just in case, uh, you know, it's similar. These are the trends to expect, you know, the, the, the sun will peak over the hill at this time and go down at this time. Um, but actually the, the one interesting one that has come up this week is we're doing a project right now on judging bias um, in a number of our different sports. So uh, really looking at um, you know aerials, moguls, some of these sports where there is that uh, subjective piece to how an athlete does. And we were we've really been looking at it on kind of a country by country basis. Is there a home judged bias uh, or just you know from your own country? Um, and looks like maybe, by the way, <laughs> but uh, we were looking at what other variables we could um, add into that. And we have been thinking about looking at weather. Um, should you be changing your run and, and your, your trick um, when it's this weather versus this? And I think that'll be really interesting to look at going forward. Awesome. Okay, so um, Marcus asked, do you have any examples of an athlete going too far or being too obsessed with data or self anal analysis? So you don't have to call anyone out individually, but is there any, are there athletes that get too involved in it that stress too much over it, would you say? Yes, uh, I mean, I think there is a balance where you can get too much inside your own head. And that is somewhat up to the training staff to kind of work with an athlete, you know, and decide what's what's helpful versus what's not helpful. For our sleep data, for instance, some athletes don't like to see 
how they slept. Um, so it actually only the coach is looking at that because if they wake up the morning of the competition and see that they slept poorly, that's going to get inside their head. Um, but I do think I, I heard an interesting talk by Matt Whitcom a couple weeks ago um, where the, the cross country team does a, a test on the roller ski treadmill, which is this giant treadmill the size of a room. And it's to measure VO2 max fitness. So they're really just on this treadmill um, from, it just keeps going a little bit steeper and a little bit faster every minute. And you have a harness. And so you're really just on there until you fall off. Um, and what, what Matt talked about, he's the, the head coach of the cross country team, is that there's a bar um, on the front and you're able to grab that bar when you're done, if you want. And so when the athletes are doing this testing in the early morning, um, when the gym's not full, they're very often gonna grab onto that bar and say, I'm done with the test. But in the middle of the afternoon, when there is a, uh, you know, maybe 50 Alpine skiers in there, a bunch of 200 pound guys listen to, you know, really loud music and you, they see that you're nearing the end of that test, they're gonna circle that treadmill and, and really, chant you on and there's no chance you're grabbing that bar you are going absolutely until you fall off the edge of the treadmill and that harness has to catch you and his point with that story was that there is more to our sports than just the analytics um, and so every time you get too much into the numbers you have to realize that there's a large mental piece of this sport and of course we're trying to understand that better as well but there's so much there um, really interesting I think to, to take a step back sometimes um, and, and realize that, yeah, there is more than the numbers. These are whole people. They have other things going on with their life and um, we can affect performance in a number of different ways. Awesome. So Jake has asked, is there a lot of data an analytics in determining which waxes to use or is it more driven by wax gurus? And do you see this changing in the future? Huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, wax gurus is BS. Uh, I worked for the US ski team for one plus years as, you know, one, uh, dedicated to, to just specifically waxing. And um, <laughs> there's no such thing as a wax guru. The, the people who are best at waxing are literally just the ones who test the most. Um, and really, and interestingly, a number of our different teams uh, they, they've done it in somewhat of an archaic way, I would say, basically like a process of elimination. This wax beat this wax, so this wax moves on. Um, and there's, there's a lot of uh, problems with that strategy. So we were trying to become more scientific with it. Um, and then we got hit with the fact that they are actually banning fluoros, um, so the fluorinated waxes, kind of getting in the weeds. But they're changing the waxes that we can use in the next year. Um, so that'll bring a, a whole new uh, uh, problems. Um, but with this fresh start, we are looking at approaching in, in a little bit uh, smarter way, I would say, to understand what's actually in these waxes um, from a, using a little bit more chemistry and then understanding what snow types they actually uh, correspond to. Um, and previously, we've done this really anecdotally, and now we're we've gotten much better at actually collecting the data and then relying on people who have ex expertise in that, that maybe field of actual science to tell us, um, yeah, how we, can, how we can improve going forward. That's very interesting. So we have a few more questions from the audience. Um, Lily, let's throw this one to you. Um, I know you guys have obviously mentioned um, wearables play a big role. Um, but Tyler has asked, what tools are you using for the collecting, wrangling, and analyzing of data? So are there some other big key players other than wearables? Yeah, I think so for the collecting of data, um, I think wearables are the big one for kind of the micro for athlete level data. Um, but for uh, macro data, like performance, historical results, all that stuff, um, we collect most of it by scraping the FIS, which is the um, International Ski Federation, their, their databases um, and their website. Um, so that's kind of how I collect the data and then use mostly uh, or a combination of R and Excel to 
to wrangle the data. Um, and then was the third, like an, anal, uh, analyze and visualize. Um, also primarily R. And one interesting thing there, Natalie, I think a lot of the, the data that might be most helpful to our staff and athletes right now is really, I talked about this centralized system, um, but actually a lot of the just more qualitative writing essentially is really helpful to be able to keep in one place that at this camp, this is what happened last year. These are my notes. And then when you go back the next year, your notes from that camp are just right there. And you're able to, oh yeah, that's right. This person did have trouble here or the altitude affected us like this or the snow type did this. Um, and really just putting that at the front of the mind to, to let the coaches, um, yeah, to put them in a better position to exceed, uh, to succeed. So um, John has asked, it strikes me that there are other sports that share some characteristics with skiing. Every run is different, weather is a major factor, unpredictable, et cetera. Sailing comes to mind. Do you guys do any collaboration with data analytics staff from other US Olympic sports? And I, and I think just to elaborate on his question, do you guys collaborate with other sports in general? Yeah, I think, um, so this summer, Gus actually uh, organized a weekly like collaboration share meeting. Um, I think it stemmed from just wanting to break up the virtual work week. I, I know like I'm pretty sure everyone's experienced uh, Zoom fatigue or computer fatigue, um, but it was a really great opportunity to bring in um, mostly people that Gus knew um, and just kind of talk to them about what they're doing in different uh, fields of data analytics. So we talked with some people from USA Swimming, um, which was, it was really great to just like share ideas and hear what other sports are doing. And then we also collaborate with the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. I don't know, Gus, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it, a few other teams have different kind of structures. Swimming and track and field would be the easiest one where, where they have a national team, but, but they're really decentralized, meaning they have a really strong collegiate system. So most of their athletes are actually with their collegiate teams and they, the trainers from those programs really have a very limited impact on what athletes are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and the same kind of with US, uh, uh, the US Olympic Committee. I mean, they are above US ski and snowboard. So they are actually one step more removed from the athletes. Um, so oftentimes if we have problems, they do have some pretty talented data people there and we will um, we'll ask them or, or you know, try and work with them on specific problems. But I would say the team that we've worked most closely with is, um, is USA Swimming, um, just because they have been active at a number of different conferences, whether presenting or attending along with me. Um, and what, they, what I'm really interested that they do, I think really well, um, is they do video analysis uh, really well. So they're able to dive into the technique of their athletes um, to an amazing level and really work it out. And obviously <laughs> USA Swimming has had some success. Now the, the difference there is they have this amazingly controlled environment where they can look at every angle of every second that their swimmers do, where that we do not have that. But one of the challenges we are working on is really looking at a technique across all of our sports and trying to quantify what is good technique and what is bad technique. What is the minimum level you have to achieve and what level um, do you need to achieve to really be the best in the world? Um, and, and setting up those, uh, that kind of system um, and looking at how we analyze that is really something we can we can learn from them. Yeah, that's that's amazing. You guys are doing a lot over there, um, and I, I appreciate you sharing that with us today. So um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. I think that was um, an awesome overview of of all the things you guys are working on, and really what we can see um, of what's to come with this program growing so rapidly, but yet there's you know so much to be explored. So. Um, Lily and Gus, do you guys want to share kind of where people can engage with you um, in the future if they choose or if they need to ask you more questions or anything along those lines? Yeah, 
Lily, I know you mentioned maybe LinkedIn was your yeah favorite. yeah I think LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me. Yeah, probably same here, Natalie. We're not the uh, I guess we're not the biggest social media teams. <laughs> turns out, but Gus Kading, K-A-E-D-I-N-G. Um, I've already spoken with a few of you on LinkedIn and, and I'm looking forward to connecting. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I think that's one of the best things about the sports world, particularly here in the US, is people are really open about connecting and sharing ideas. Um, there's lots of times there's not overlapping competition. And even if there is, um, you know, it's all about helping the athletes and, and coaches perform better. So, so that's what we're here for. Awesome. Yeah. And if anyone wants to shoot us um, any questions that you haven't got to ask, um, I can get them to Gus and Lily as well. So you can follow us at Comcast Sport um, and you can also learn more at ComcastSportsTech.com. Um, Lily and Gus, I think that was an awesome, awesome discussion. Um, I appreciate your time and we look forward to sharing more about what you're up to in the future. So thank you guys for joining us today. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Have a good one.